So really, this is the first area that you encounter. Gotcha. So they're all here, chilling, doing their trumpet thing. This is the four Oracle Envoy Spirits. So, Ashen remains in which spirits yet dwell. Used to summon the spirit of four Oracle Envoys. Spirits of a monstrous band of musicians who employ sacred arts. It is said when Oracle Envoys appear playing their pipes, they do so to herald the arrival of a new god or a new age. So we're going to get into that lore here. There we go. Okay, so that one controlled. So first off, um, I want to show you here. Um, so you've seen the band, right? These guys. Sorry if that's like way too loud. But here we have a modern uh, Xiaomi band. And you can see that you've got definitely like these woods where they're pointed down and they're blowing. And they've also got like these bigger ones where they're pointed up. And they've also got these ones that are like a four group. Um, so it's really cool with this, with this um, particular um, instrument is it can go up to 16 tone chromatic. Um, so see hopefully are these YouTube videos coming up okay cool so they are coming up through here um, yeah so it, right it really looks like it it's kind of like they've got all three um, so this is like the one that has definitely the most which really reminds me of like the great envoy horn um, so it can go up to a, a 16 tone scale um, but it's done through, you see he's, he's moving his fingers there um, to control which of those bells the sound is going through. Because typically you would see an instrument like this and kind of assume that it is, you know, like a trumpet, like a brass instrument, but it's not, it's a reed instrument. So I looked further into uh, the um, history behind this weapon or this I keep calling it's, it's a weapon in the game but it's um uh it's an instrument in real life and so here is the the uh description from the envoys long horn long golden horn of the oracle envoys profoundly weighty its blows are sure to be felt originally an instrument but one that cannot be sounded by a mere human or perhaps it is too early to sound the call which is, is it too early because of uh, the age of the Erd trees coming or going? Or maybe it's related to Mikola's era and age, which obviously gets interrupted by uh, Moog abducting Mikola. Uh, or, you know, the other person that's at the Halic tree, uh, Melania, who. Um, you know, is, is a god in her own right, the goddess of rot, you know, it could be heralding her age. So we really don't know. There's a lot of def definite options. Um, this image right here is from uh, from a museum. Um, and then this was really the one that like, I was like, oh shit, this is definitely <laughs> where they pulled this, I, this, this concept of this design from um, because it's like this really golden version of it. Um, and then there's this really kind of cool, like, you know, silvery version. This is, this is like kind of really what they look like now in like modern day. Um, so like I said, you know, we find them both in the in Lendell and in the Haley tree canopy. Um, I already went over the, the ashes, um, and what they're, um, what their whole description is, but I just again wanted to highlight that they're a band of musicians. Um, so they're not just, they're not soldiers, they're not warriors, they're a, a band of musicians. Um, and it is, it is a musical instrument first and foremost, um, and then a weapon secondly. Um, 
So looking at the um, the Shaomai as the musical instrument, um, it first came from the uh, Tyrolean area of Europe, which was uh, Austria or East Germany, um, and it came in all sorts of different sizes. Uh, you can you can see there's versions in a soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, and bass. Um, so it really is like a full band, um, and it has this kind of ensemble that is similar to um, you know to like a like a brass band and. I'll, I'll get into that in a second um, of why of why that's so important. So it looks like a brass wind, but it's not. It's it's a lot more like an accordion or a harmonica. Um, so each of those bells is only making one tone. So that's why they have to have it in all of you know the different sizes and the different bells so they can get this whole range of tones across basically the whole band. Um, so the man that invented uh, the Shaomai is Max B. Martin. Um, what he did is he put <laughs> different free reed uh, horns controlled by valves and just kind of put them all together into one instrument. Um, and what happened uh, after that is that it became really popular uh, with the German Communist Party. Um, and it's still, it's still a, a, an instrument that is played around Germany today. Um, which we can see in that example of the YouTube video. Um, and I'll definitely link all of these videos. Um, and this whole this whole essay here is, uh, is, is free to look at, and I'll have a link in the description and everything. Um, but what was really interesting is even before the 1920s, um, Martin's uh, company was, um, was creating... Um, these horns to be used on cars, to be used on fire engines. Um, they're still used today, even in um, emergency vehicles in Germany. Um, and where this gets kind of really interesting and into the, the political realm, um, and I think it's it's really cool that they relate it to like this idea of like the arrival of a new god or a new age, is this comes this invention comes about during like one of the most, um, one of the most kind of like world changing uh, periods of time in modern history, right? So the, the prototype um, was created and presented to Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, um, who was the last emperor of Germany. Um, and he didn't really get it. <laughs> so he was like, I don't, I don't understand like this music. Um, it was a prototype, so he said, put it on the front of my car and uh, it'll be a warning that my car is coming down the road, basically. Uh, so I thought that was just such an interesting thing because it's like, oh, da -da -da -da, here comes the king, here comes the emperor. Um, and then after uh, after after World War I, um, which was basically the war that uh, the Kaiser um, led led Germany into, and ultimately he was uh, de deposed of because of it. Um, after that war, um, a lot of the unemployed uh, war veterans took up this um, took up playing this weapon, uh, not this weapon, playing this instrument. Um, and you know, as unemployed war war veterans, you know, they were. Um, you know, more, more, more kind of like left-leaning and socialists and everything. Um, so I found this um, this little kind of like poem. Um, it says, "Time clock and starvation wages, cabbage steam and inflation, unemployed and stamps don't see any hope. Mass rally, Teddy spoke, industrial action, eight-hour day, red flag, May Day, and I was there, played the sham." So the sham is like another term um, for the for the shaomai. Um, I don't use it as much because it also is the name of like a much older um, medieval instrument that is just kind of like a more simple horn. Um, but so you know you have you have the 1920s. Um, you have you know after World War One you have kind of this area 
uh, called the Sar Land, which is, is like this big coal mining area. And it's really kind of that area that um, was really disputed um, and kind of like, you know, like Germany wanted to kind of claim it, but the French also wanted to claim it. And, um, you know, it, it definitely is like kind of one of those disputed areas that then kind of leads into World War II. Um, so during the Weimar Republic, which is, you know, the government that came about after, um, after getting rid of uh, the Kaiser, um, there was, you know, the, this big rise of, of the right wing. Um, and they would have, you know, these huge parades um, with all of their big brass instruments and everything. And it's, you know, it was like this, this, um, uh, you know, like this marching music and huge parades and everything. But then with the invention of uh, the Martin horn or the Shaomai, um, the basically like the workers and like the, the coal mines and then like the camps and stuff, um, they took up this instrument because it was really actually really easy to learn. Um, like I said, you know, as opposed to like a trumpet where you are having to, um, I want to say to that popcorn crunch, yes, uh, where you're having to, you know, create all the notes with your lips um, and you're having to have a lot more training to be able to do that. Um, this you could just, just blow and then use, you know, your fingers to, to pick which valve, which bell it's coming out of. Um, you know, so this was before the eight hour work day when it was, they were doing like a 12 hour day. Uh, so they did not have a lot of time after that to like sit around and just learn some sort of complicated musical instrument. Um, but this was one that could be easily picked up and it could actually match the volume um, of like the right wingers and their parades with their huge bass, um, uh, brass instruments, like, you know, the trumpets, trombones, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it really became associated with socialists, with communists, with workers. Um, with the labor movement and you know obviously the very opposite of that is, is 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 the right wing and you know that eventually turns into you know the Nazi party um, so and I have uh, the source here but it says the 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 shall the shall mine or the shall man the famous trumpet invented by Max B Barton were hated above all um, and that's from, from a book about about the um, the Nazis. Um, and so, you know, fast forward a little bit further into where the Nazis come into power in the 1930s. Um, they thought, okay, we can totally use this um, for ourselves and, and for, for, you know, our own control over the people or everything. But at that point, it was just way too associated with communists, with social democrats, with, you know, like the labor movement. Um, so they said, no, we're going to, we're going to totally ban it. Um, so, uh, they, they banned them, they bur they buried them. Um, they would destroy them with anvils. Um, so it was like basically like a really like public execution of these, um, of these instruments and everything that they represented. Um, so you kind of almost lose them in World War II. Um, but after World War II, um, obviously, you know, Germany was, was divided. Um, you had the allies who uh, took control over the western side of Germany, and then you had the Soviets who, um, you know, were con had, had, you know, defeated, you know, the Nazis on that front. Um, so they, they were in control of the eastern side, and, and Berlin was basically kind of split in the middle. Um, so the government of East Germany um, kind of basically brought back this instrument because, again, it was so associated with communism and socialism and labor movements um, that that, you know, just really fit more within like their ideology. Um, as, as, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the Soviets and the um, 
the, the United Soviet States of, of Russia were, you know, all, all, all going through like a form of communism at that time. Um, so there was um, the instrument, you know, became used kind of like in, um, what was it called? It was, it, was, it was like basically their like kind of version of like uh, like a youth culture program and everything. Um, so it was like really popular and it was like used in a lot of schools um, and then it was still something that like people that worked in factories could play and, and use and was really popular. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of almost, you know, we kind of almost lost it entirely to history during World War II. Um, but then, you know, it was kind of like brought back. Um, so then, you know, if you don't know, like May 1st or May Day is like a really big day for like, especially like the labor movement and everything. Um, so, you know, it would be uh, definitely played like during that, during public rallies and everything. Um, yeah, and the FDJ, who that was the um, basically like the, the program for, uh, for, for, for the youth, the youth, the youth part of like, the communist political party basically um so um yeah it's just a lot of kind of really interesting um background and stuff um i i feel like you know there's so much talking about history especially european history um in the um in in Elden Ring um you know it's like definitely like Miyazaki and his team and and George R. R. Martin like they did their homework <laughs> you know like they're definitely all like students of history I mean there's just like so many things throughout the game that you can like specifically kind of pinpoint like this um and I'm also realizing there's kind of this kind of cool like almost like Norse like kind of rune background that's going on in the in the in the stone relief behind the ashes there so that's kind of interesting too um so i really think like it was it was a combination of um you know just this such unique visual look of this instrument and then just like that there's so much like political uh and his, you know, so much political history, so much history about the war, about World War One, about World War Two, um, you know, and obviously like that is an event that has really determined kind of like the world order after that for the next like uh, at least half century or more. Um, you know, I, I would ar argue that up until really like you know, the United States kind of going on, it's like war, war on terror and everything. Like that is kind of like the next big kind of turning point we see in kind of like world history and, and, and the changing of like geopolitical power and everything. Um, but really it's like out of, out of World War II, you have, you know, you have the whole period of the Cold War and you have this whole idea of like, um, East versus West, especially, and, um, you know, all of, like, the East falling under communism and the sphere of, like, this domino effect that, like, well, Russia's gonna, Russia's communist, and then if China's communist, then all these other countries are gonna end up communist, um, so it's, like, it's really just such a big point of, like, world geopolitics and, um, and kind of, like, the, the Cold War and like the covert wars and proxy wars that are going on between, you know, the two kind of biggest, um, the two biggest like superpowers of the time. Um, yeah, powerful statement to make your religious instrument. Yeah, uh, the Oracle envoys are depicted as pretty holy, I'd say. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting because it's like, you know, they don't have this like, specifically like religious connotation to them but you know it's kind of like well how do you look at like spirituality you know it's like 
is the fight for freedom, is the fight for workers' rights. Like, you know, you could really argue like that that is, um, you know, a spiritual movement in a way, um, you know, and you definitely have sort of, um, especially with um, Eric, um, Eric Honecker, who is the socialist um, party leader, like you kind of have, um, you know, almost, almost like a, not quite like religious volume, but like he's a, he's, he's again, like this very like big political leader. Um, and he was actually the, the person that like, um, was instrumental behind like the, the drive to build the Berlin wall and to not let people try and escape East Germany and stuff. Um, he ended up even kind of calling upon, um, like the Soviets to like, uh, you know, reinforce and, and bring troops in and everything. Um, but, you know, eventually, you know, as, as, as history unfolded, um, eventually, you know, the Berlin wall came down and, um, you know, the two halves of Germany were, were kind of reconciled and, and reunited. Um, but it really just brings up like such a pivotal time in human history you know going back from like the kaiser who was leading you know germany into being um you know a, a world colonial power and you know in that process you know committing horrible horrible atrocities um you know committing really what's called one of the first um genocides of the 20th century you know like even predating like um you know, predating the Holocaust, predating um, the Armenian Genocide, um, the Herero and uh, Namaqua, and I, I, I apologize, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, um, but basically, you know, they, they massacred um, people in, in, in those parts of, uh, of, of Africa. Um, so it, it's, it's really fitting in with a lot of the things that this game is bringing up. You know, this game is definitely bringing up these issues of colonization. It's definitely bringing up, like, these issues of what happens in war. Um, and, you know, what happens when, um, when people are, you know, de dehumanized. Because that's really what leads into genocide is, is, you know, Germans, they were seeing these people as being less than human. Um, so that is, is, you know, again, what gets repeated later, you know, in the Holocaust, you know, with, with, the, with the Jewish people is that they're dehumanized and racialized um, so that, you know, they're seen as so less than. Um, so I think it is really, um, I think it is really like significant that they, they, they chose this, this weapon um, and that they chose it, you know, to um yeah yeah space helmet it's really a, a horn of upheaval right um so it's like i think it is really significant and i i feel like this game doesn't just point you in the direction of like the lore within the game but it really does point you to like human history um with all the things that it's referencing um so this was my uh, kind of big discovery I felt and I really just wanted to you know really share that um, with people and really kind of share um, some of the, the sources and stuff so I will um, when I make this kind of edit this down into a YouTube video I'll make sure to link my kind of whole essay here um, but just so you can see this is kind of cool where I found this is the, uh, the from the vault of the Wende Museum um, and they talk all about, um, you know, the resurgence of this in, in East Germany. Um, you can see, I think this is one, this image here, and this is the one that I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely it, right? It's all golden and everything. Um, I can't remember, I think this is one, does it say this is the one that, um, there was a really popular, there was like a really popular musician in East Germany um, and Eric Honecker 
either Eric Honecker gave him uh, a Shalma on his birthday or the other way around. I'll see if I can uh, find it here. But um, yeah, you can see here, there's like, there's the little band. Um, Eric Honecker is one of these guys in here. Um, and then you can see kind of like in contemporary day, you know, people still still playing this this instrument and it's like even the way that they hold it like is so similar to the way that like they're holding it and playing it in the game um, here's also cool you could see uh this is on i think this is like the modern right the martin trumpets website because they're still they're still being made so you have uh, all the different kind of versions here. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. All right, so you have just this one that's like just a couple, just, you know, a few, but then they have them, you know, going all the way up to these super long ones. Then you have the eight note, um, which I definitely think looks a lot like the, the great horn or the long horn. Um, I mean, this one's really cool. The trumpet bass is like super long. Um, this one actually here, the trumpet piccolo reminds me a lot of the, of the one you see here in the game. Um, and there's just all these kind of variations all the way up to, you know, 16 notes. huge this is uh this cool little image here this is the site i had to <laughs> translate from german to english to find this that kind of poem but um you know you could see these like old old drawings um depicting kind of these different and it's like you, i could almost see that like showing up in the art book for elden ring <laughs> You know, and it's like you got this little guy here playing the thing, and I mean, it's like he's in his little his little worker, you know, uniform. He's like out of the just straight from the factory. Um, here you can see this is the FDJ. Um, so it's like you know they've got like this this huge thing, and they've got this big youth band all playing them. Okay, here he was. Yeah, Udo Lindbergh. Uh, this guy here, uh, a really popular. Um, musician in East Germany and he gave Eric, Eric Honecker who is basically like you know like the president of the time in East Germany um, he gave he gave him that uh, one of those as a gift um, so it's like there's just a lot of really interesting like historical like political meaning um, I think behind it so yeah, thank you guys for listening to my uh, my lore spiel there. Um, just show a couple other cool photos. Um, and you know, so I, I really, really tried to find just like as much information about this as I could. Um,